Good afternoon, everybody, uh, and uh, welcome to this panel. Uh, my name is Thomas Lundgren. I'm the chair of this session today. Um, and we should talk about developing and optimizing pharma partnership across biotech, medtech, and health tech innovation. Yesterday, there was a similar session uh, talking about how venture capital company are interested in health tech company, digital company. <clears throat> and it turned out that there are many companies in Nordic where venture capital have a lot of interest. But today uh, we are focusing on how the big pharma are interested in order to do partnership with companies in, in the Nordics. Uh, companies who are developing different kinds of technology in order to facilitate it healthcare, help with medication of medicinal products and devices. And uh, we are waiting for uh, the answer from the big pharma. And I have the pleasure to have a fantastic panel with me, uh, uh, with Philip from MSD, Inga Lill from Bayer, Mats from Merck, and Nerida from Jensen and Jensen. Uh, Jonsson and Jonsson, sorry. Um, so maybe we start in order to have a short introduction of the panelists and uh, maybe Phil, you could start. Yes, good afternoon everyone. My name is Phil Louillier. Um, I head up the business development team for Europe for MSD or uh, Merck and Co as we know it in the US and Canada. Um, I've got a team based in, in London that covers the geography of Europe and the Middle East and our primary role is looking for opportunities to uh, uh, add to and augment the pipeline for us. Um, perhaps just uh, one example of our discovery, development and commercialization capability and prowess is in the oncology space, where in 2014, we got our first approval in immuno-oncology. And since that time, arguably, we've become one of the leaders in the IO space and perhaps now through our broad range of partnerships and in-house programs, also a leader in the oncology space. So just one example of, of our development capability. Inga Lind. So, hello everyone. Uh, so I'm Inga Hiltander uh, from Bayer. Uh, and I'm currently working as a commercial operational director in Bayer Pharmaceutical in the Scandinavian region. Uh, so in that role, I'm responsible for uh, all external collaboration. And that means uh, collaboration with medtech, also with biotech, for all brands that we are, are covering. Uh, so, um, um, this is uh, that has been resulting in a lot of, uh, of uh, collaborations um, uh, within a very short period of time. Uh, we see this as, as a great opportunity and we are also encouraged from our global organization to try to establish uh, even more uh, collaborations, both as I said in Medtech and in uh, Biotech. Thank you, Matt. <coughs> Hello everyone, my name is Mats Bergian. Uh, I have a global role at Merck uh, where I lead the Digital Business Innovation Lab that uh, works uh, across uh, the healthcare business of, of Merck where we uh, work directly towards uh, the board of uh, directors uh, in, the, in the company. And uh, for us as a global technology, science and technology company, you know, this sort of uh, environment is very intriguing to see how, how we can combined our scientific knowledge and curiosity in the fields where we operate. It can be like multiple sclerosis, immune oncology, and fertility, with the sort of new, new uh, digital opportunities uh, that open up as the whole plant goes, uh, goes live. So uh, our role is to look at new business models, new services, uh, and new collaboration opportunities. And I will also mention uh, some of those that we're actively pursuing at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon, probably good morning, depending on where people are joining from. Thank you very much for asking me to join the panel. I, um, my name is Nerida Scott. 
I head up the Johnson & Johnson innovation team um, for EMEA, for early stage innovation. And uh, our team looks after early stage innovation across the three business sectors that uh, J&J is focused on, that being pharma, med device and consumer. And I think that provides a really nice platform for today's discussion. We have uh, interests spanning uh, various applications, uh, both within those sectors and potentially across those sectors. Um, and by way of uh, background, I come from a business development and licensing uh, background. I've been five years with, with J&J, &J, and I think uh, there's, a, there's a great number of collaborations that have been established uh, in the Nordic region in all sorts of different dimensions, and perhaps one that I can quickly mention here that's, that's topical given the way that we're currently working and, and having our um, conferences digitally today. Uh, but we have a very significant collaboration with Bavarian Nordic on their MVA platform in combination with our ad vaccine platform that has just generated very recently in July um, EMEA approval for an Ebola vaccine. And that's the same vaccine platform that we are working on for a COVID-19 vaccine as well. Um, and many, many more collaborations. We, can, we, we can't talk about all of them in the public domain, but I think it's a fantastically rich area for early stage innovation, both in terms of healthcare and digital applications and really looking forward to the discussion. Thanks. Thank you. Um, uh, I really hope that you're successful with the vaccine for COVID because I think all of us need that <laughs> for the moment in order to get out of this trap that we are put in all, all of us all over the world. Uh, some words about uh, the moderator, myself. Um, I'm the former executive director of European Medicine Agency. Um, I was there 10 years and I had the pleasure to build up the organization to more or less what it is today. Um, now these, these days, I divide my life in two parts. One is a regulatory consultant for the NDA group and uh, NDA is very happy with the collaboration with LSX um, in order to help them to run this uh, conference. Um, my other part of my uh, life, I'm spending uh, as a board member and uh, advisor to companies, and specific company who are involved in the area of digital health wearables. So I have two board positions in companies in Australia, one in incontinence with a device, and one in Parkinson uh, with a device in order to monitoring the Parkinson disease and also monitor the medication of Parkinson. I'm also a part owner of a company in Sweden, Scientific Med, who are developing an app in order to support patients in oncology treatment. And I do believe we have a collaboration with Merck on this. We also have a collaboration with BMS of Optivo in order to support patient uh, oncology treatments. I'm also a board member in a new company uh, in uh, depression, uh, uh, and we are developing psilocybin for treatment-resistant depression. And uh, we are also, in combination with that kind of treatment, interested in order to develop a digital tool in order to support the medication. So I have a lot of involvement in uh, innovation, digital health, uh, through my board position and so on. So I'm um, looking forward to, to this panel. Um, so we have decided that we should divide this in the life cycle of, of a medicinal product from a pharma perspective. So we have a lot of innovation in, uh, in discovery phase. Uh, what is a lot of uh, interesting thing coming up in order to select new candidates for, for uh, lead assets for, for companies. Uh, with a lot of uh, artificial intelligence, for example. Also in late stage development, there is a lot of tools that could be used uh, with different kind of biomarkers uh, from a tech, tech point of view that could help the pharmaceutical company to develop new drugs, do clinical trials. And of course, in the end, when the product is launched on the market, there is a lot of app and technology in order to follow up the medication on the market to help the healthcare system to be more effective, but also help the patient. And the question is, of course, for this panel, how well are pharma prepared in order to take on board this innovation? And I think the first question will go to 
fill uh, in order to look in how do big pharma and by tech company using digital innovation in the discovery phase of development. And please could you give some very good example of what you are doing at the MSD in this. Phil, over to you. Yes, thank you, Thomas. I'm happy to start and, uh, and uh, make some introductory comments on this question. Um, you could say in the discovery phase, traditionally we've started by trying to understand biology and use that biology uh, to elucidate how the biology is affected in disease and then take a single target approach to discover molecules in the discovery phase and move them forward into development. And of course, we've been very successful at doing that in, with drug targets such as kinase and GPCR targets. You could almost call those low hanging fruit. New innovative approaches is really important now as we take on uh, undruggable targets and we try to understand the biology of disease um, and, and link new targets to, to new biology and, uh, and to disease pairings. Um, two examples of, of the sorts of things we're doing in, the, in this space, uh, uh, things like, for example, the FinGen collaboration in Finland, and I know most of us around the table are part of that collaboration. Innovation, in a sense, in the model when we first started that, all coming together as a pharma industry with the Finnish folk um, to build a pre-competitive consortia. And of course, as uh, people that are involved in that will know, it's a pre-competitive consortia with the University of Helsinki, the Finnish biobanks and the Finnish government. Um, as you can suggest, as you can understand from the name, it's focused on using human genetics to understand target biology and identify novel targets to move forward. Another area that we, um, and I think others are doing um, in a similar way, is utilising the AI machine learning approaches. There's quite a number of uh, companies, biotechs, now in this space, really bringing together global data sets, curating global data sets using algorithms, AI and machine learning to generate, I'll say, digital associations between targets and disease. And then th using those digital approaches, we then take those on to, to validate targets. We have a number of uh, collaborations, some of those not in the public domain in that area, looking to use the digital approach to identify targets and then bring them into the wet lab setting for, for target validation. And then, of course, there are others in the the space that are using this type of approach in more a chemistry driven way, uh, optimizing molecules. And one example uh, of that is uh, the company actually in the UK, Exientia, who are using an AI approach to drive chemistry optimization in the discovery phase. Um, let me stop there and provide an opportunity for panel members to add other examples. Yep. Yeah, I Matt. suppose there are, are, are uh, a lot. Not only MSD uh, are using this. <laughs> so please, Inga Lil. Uh, so um, um, uh, I would just continue with, with the comment about the uh, the importance of these collaboration, uh, and I will move then a uh, little bit uh, to a later stage, uh, because we all know that the the development of digital innovation. Uh, that they're more or less uh, exploding. And, and as a global uh, pharmaceutical company, you can't possibly be on top of everything when it comes to, to this kind of, of development. Uh, so uh, I think it's a competitive advantage uh, if you are able to create uh, collaboration with both with medtech and, and biotech uh, companies. I think it's also we need to uh, to um, look a little bit into the future with the demographic uh, development, development of, of cost uh, for the healthcare system. We I think we are all planning to launch new and in innovative products. Maybe precision medicine will, will which will increase the cost tremendously. Uh, and uh, I think that we uh, need to be uh, to take uh, more responsibility and to contribute a bit more uh, when it comes to to partnership and when it comes to uh, uh, to what industry can contribute with uh, in order to get our 
products uh, reimbursed uh, to the price that, that we uh, that we would like to have, uh, and that's where where I think that the the external collaboration uh, will come in as a great support. For instance, with prevention program, uh, before we start the medication, with different kind of follow up programs after we have initiated the medication. Uh, and if I can uh, continue right now with uh, with comments about um, how we introduce uh, could, our could, could, uh, Ingelil, could I go Sorry. back to the question? Yeah. We, because we were still on early development with Phil's yeah. comments and Phil asked for feedback from, from uh, the rest of us. Um, uh, is there any other feedback from Nereida and Mats on, on the early development? An example from your company where you have yeah. gone in and worked together with, uh, especially partnership with uh, companies in the Nordic area? Yeah, so I think we're well, building on Phil's example, maybe from the FinGen, because I think those kind of data sets provide a really rich environment that generate huge numbers of opportunities. And I think to Ingelil's point about trying to use these data sets to help with prevention, I think there's fantastic examples uh, stemming from the use, for example, of FinGen. And, you know, one of the ones that we've been involved in is trying to look at type 1 diabetes, which has a really high prevalence rate in Finland at, you know, one in 100 children. And obviously, diabetes is a hugely um, a challenging disease to manage from a patient perspective, but also from a healthcare perspective. Uh, cost perspective. And I think the initiative that we're looking at with that data set is trying to understand better what the disease progression pathway looks like and trying to be able to intercept very early and try and avert or delay the onset of the disease. So it, combining a whole bunch of different technologies, you know, the data set around the genomics, being able to identify patients and bring them in, and then be able to monitor them over a very long period of time. Uh, we have a, 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 a digitally smart uh, diaper that the children wear that helps try and uh, measure uh, precursors um, in, in the urine uh, to try and then alert the parents when there's any uh, early stages of diabetic ketoacidosis, for example, that can help bring the medical profession to the patient at the very earliest stages. And I think that whole uh, piece around being able to use data and health tech in, in looking at population studies and progression um, biomarkers and being able to try and then pinpoint and predict, use that data in the future to predict who's going to be the most susceptible and pull them out early, I think has huge potential value. And I think there's, you know, j and is, you know, spending huge amounts of, of time and energy trying to look at that defined world without disease and actually not wait till people are sick, but try and intervene earlier. So I, you know, want to provide opportunities for other people to, to contribute too, but I think there's fantastic examples in the Nordic region where those data sets are very rich and they're very longitudinally um, robust which is essential to be able to try and make a real difference in this space. I can make uh, one comment there. I mean, uh, we, we, what is really intriguing in, in this uh, space, where, where, as you mentioned, it becomes very data rich, is, is that we don't only have the, the biology data, biology, but basically we have like uh, uh, data in a, in a continuum uh, in all the places that will sort of guide our research. And to that end, uh, Merck has uh, a number of collaborations with uh, Karolinska, where we look at uh, the sort of uh, the biology data sets, but but also from the from the from the from the different registries that are out there. But then also, what is really fascinating how that, that can be also combined in a disease like multiple sclerosis with imaging technologies and so on. And to to that end, uh, I think we're approaching. Uh, going from this sort of linear approach where we talk, have the, that sort of value chain where the data is more in, almost in a sort of a circular mode as we sort of approach this to, to solve very tricky scientific problems. And uh, there, there I would say that biology is perhaps the most tricky problem uh, to, to solve and uh, it can also give uh, surprises that are expected or not expected. But uh, so, yeah, but definitely I see the, uh, the Nordics uh, as a sort of good uh, environment for 
or uh, leveraging the data in sort of uh, this circular way. Okay, uh, so we're talking a little about early development and, uh, and discovery phase. And uh, what about applications that are coming in during the late development, uh, certainly during the clinical trials? Uh, so what kind of innovation do we have there uh, in order to facilitate clinical development of a new drug? And uh, Nereida, maybe you could yep. continue on that. Yeah, and I mean, I think it's it's an extension into what are you trying to measure and how can you get data and, and today's environment provides the ability to collect data in very different ways. And I think, you know, particularly in chronic illnesses where remote collection is invaluable and collection that can happen uh, over a long period of time where disease progression might be slow, for example, in the Alzheimer's disease space. Uh, clinical trial um, identification of really good biomarkers and validation of those biomarkers in a digital ecosystem is really, um, you know, coming to the fore. You know, J and J uh, Janssen, our pharma division, uh, entered a collaboration with uh, a startup company called Medopad. They've been renamed Huma, um, but it was essentially looking at uh, facilitating. Um, collection of data for early Alzheimer's patients by testing their verbal memory remotely in the home setting and that's happening both in the NHS in the UK but also in China um, and it's collecting that data in a way that you can um, validate the algorithms that are trying to assess progression and be able to use that to help monitor and provide clinical support for studies in, in Alzheimer's disease. Um, and that, that automated basis is only facilitated because we have digital technology. And I think, you know, today's environment, um, people's acceptance and openness to being able to use these tools is only accelerated, right? COVID has forced all of us, you know, the medical profession, the regulatory profession, and all of our clinic, clinical staff to try and think of new ways that are safe and effective to be able to manage these studies. I think another one that you know, is, is really good to mention in this setting as well is, is GenJ has a very substantial collaboration with Apple around the Apple Watch um, and looking at potential uh, arterial fibrillation. And there's an entire app-driven study called HeartWave uh, which is, is basically collecting data from patients who don't even know they have AFib. People can sign up to it uh, in a certain age population. And it tracks over time their ECGs and other heart um, um, data through their Apple Watch and feeds that back into the study. So these technologies allow you to do very broad-based um, population work remotely so it's very effective and efficient as long as it's you know validated technology and can inform how you select patients how you inform uh, those patients that need to seek medical advice if for example AFib becomes a diagnosis that patient can then become uh, more closely monitored to ensure that they have uh, a, a lower probability of having a stroke Today in the marketplace, 30% of people with AFib don't even know they have it. So there's all these fantastic ways of being able to combine technology at great scale, um, effective clinical development, and, and particularly in those conditions that are chronic or affecting very large proportions of the population. Yeah, and certainly, you know, uh, I, I, FDA have opened up, uh, be a little more open, and uh, Europe also have opened up. But you know, it's still very difficult to get new innovation and digital te technology to be accepted as a primary and secondary endpoint in a in a in a in a large clinical trials, uh, because the requirement in order to validate this uh, is 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 very high. But I, I must say that uh, the COVID had a positive effect that all the clinical trials was going on in the whole world. Uh, the regulators have to look at it in a different way because you know, uh, they started to allow remote monitoring, <laughs> uh, home monitoring, uh, home, home uh, applications. Uh, so there was, there was, 
you know, in one go, we did move, I think, two or three years in development in order to accept this tool from a regulatory point of view. So, 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 so that is a positive effect, I think, of the COVID-19 uh, uh, mm. coming up. Uh, so any other comments on, on uh, what, what we heard here just now? Mats, you seem to be... I have one comment there, and I believe the whole sort of setting about clinical trials could be on the way on a, on a, on a tremendous shift where there, this sort of also value chain is about to change. I mean, you mentioned, Thomas, how the regulators are sort of uh, looking at how to take these new endpoints uh, and the digital biomarkers and Rita mentioned on board. But that also opens up, and this is important for, for new players to work uh, with uh, these types of, of uh, uh, virtual clinical trials. And I believe we see a new actor center there, like online doctors, pharmacy chains that are all sort of leaving their, their physical setting, moving into the sort of digital setting. So, so uh, I believe that the whole sort of value chain of clinical trials is, is about to rapidly change. And to that effect, also that uh, that uh, the data generated will be sort of uh, fresh and on the go, not a, a snap uh, shot that uh, something that uh, we did uh, to prove efficacy and safety along ten, five, five, ten years uh, back. Yeah. So clinical trials will be on the go. Let's see if that holds true. QS onwards. Let me ask a question, if I may, Max, given what you've said there, and, and Narita, back to your introduction. Um, I was mentioning FinGen earlier, where we are collaborating as a pharma industry in a pre-competitive sense. If the clinical trial environment and the data sets change, or the clinical trial environment changes and the data sets get larger, uh, more digital approaches, do you see us as an industry collaborating in the late development phase? Like just as one example of collaboration, we are pre-competitively in the very early stage. No, uh, de de definitely because uh, I mean uh, this is uh, this is an industry where you know that's based on, on science and scientific advancement, but it's also requirement is also that there's a, a robust uh, regulatory framework there mm -hmm. and. Uh, as you know, there are several examples from, uh, from the, how the FDA changes their approach. You see the same in Europe, but also in, in um, how national legislation is also looking in a different uh, way of that. And uh, of course, a lot of it is also propelled by, by, by COVID. And I believe definitely that uh, as an industry, we should uh, sort of uh, approach this and, uh, and to, see, uh, to sort of see how, how can we sort of develop this in partnership with uh, the regulatory authorities and the different bodies to sort of open up uh, these possibilities because uh, uh, I believe uh, that's the, the, way I, the way ahead if we want to advance uh, the lives of uh, millions of people in a, in a new uh, but positive way. Okay, should we so then yes, move to... Yes, a short uh, yeah. question. <laughs> yeah, this, yes. Should we then move to uh, more or less uh, talking about the commercial stage when, uh, when we have launched uh, a drug on the market or we have launched one of these innovations for, uh, you know, in a commercial way in the market. How does that look, uh, Inga Lil? You, you, um, you, you, you have a special look into that aspect. Yeah, so I will then move for, for early stage uh, collaboration over to hands-on and real life uh, example, and I will give you a couple of them. Uh, and I agree with you, Thomas, to your point that uh, the COVID-19 situation really uh, made us very much aware of the need for a digital solution. And I think that also uh, the healthcare system, at least here in Scandinavia, became uh, extremely much aware and, and took a, a giant leap into the future. So uh, what we have done uh, in an early stage of, of commercialization is the first example uh, I will mention is a, a digital heart monitor uh, named Koala, uh, which you can use for detection for AFib. So uh, Nerida, I will... Uh, uh, continue to discuss the AFib monitoring and the importance of it. Uh, so you just put the, uh, the monitor on top of your heart and the information will be stored in a cloud, could be downloaded by your specialist like a cardiologist or your GP, 
and you don't need to actually see your healthcare professional in order to uh, to be diagnosed. So when we started this collaboration, this was uh, just for the private market and no activities toward the healthcare professionals. And this, the cardiovascular market is, of course, of great importance for us. Uh, so when we established the, the, this collaboration, we were able, based on, on uh, our partnership with Koala, to offer something on top of our medication to the healthcare providers and the healthcare system. And Koala uh, were offered actually to, to be promoted by our sales and marketing department. What we have been able to do is a very rapid uh, transformation of the collaboration during the COVID-19 phase uh, to create a 100% digital uh, patient chain. So you don't need to go to your healthcare professional at all in order to be diagnosed and in order to be treated, uh, which has been, of course, uh, a great step into the future and uh, which could also be a great support in order to kind of clean up uh, in what the COVID-19 situation has, has left behind. Uh, another situation could be that you are in the pre-launch or pre-commercialization phase of a medical device that needs to, that needs some additional validation uh, where we can, uh, when we started a, a collaboration with a digital pill box uh, named Piloxa, uh, this pill box uh, is, is functioning very much like Koala, so you are gathering all the information in the cloud. You will be reminded if you forget to take your pill. And uh, for us, this was a fantastic opportunity to, to collaborate with Piloxa, to be able to offer this kind of adherence uh, control option and, and create uh, clinical trials, as we are now starting in Norway, a cardiology uh, trial, which uh, primary endpoint is to monitor the adherence uh, of the medication. Uh, so I think that there is, there is uh, so many, like endless opportunities uh, for collaboration, where we can offer as a big pharma company, internal competencies like regulatory support, like medical support, like legal support, whatever. And in, uh, as a reward, we can also uh, offer something on top of our products to uh, the healthcare system. Could I, could I um, ask you a question about that? So Absolutely. how much commercial interest do pharmaceutical company really have when you're launching a new drug? to get a digital t tool or a variables that are supporting your treatment. Um, because it's not clear cut uh, how who is paying for it and how it will be implemented either in the healthcare system because you are going into a, an established healthcare system who have their routines and so on and then you are requesting them to do something new with the, with the thing. So, um, I have seen some lukewarm response from some pharmaceutical companies in order to add something to their drug treatment, the form of our wearables or digital health app or whatever it is. Could you say something about the difficulties here in order to go commercial with these kind of technologies? Um. Yeah, I think there is a, a yeah, there are some hurdles uh, to be overcome, uh, and I think that you need to be as a tech company or a biotech company, you need to to have defined your business model because you need to know whether you will approach like this the healthcare system uh, uh, with it as with your uh, wearable as a uh, tender product or if you would like to have it promoted as an, uh, an add-on uh, tool, so to say, or an add-on add -on product. So I think the first thing that we have discovered is that when we are discussing uh, this in an early stage, uh, the business model is not pretty clear. Uh, so this is something that we sometimes we have been able to, to partner up in discussion and lead uh, very early uh, or uh, very uh, startups which don't have that much experience of commercialization. Uh, so this is this is number one. 
And then also that we need to stick to certain regulation in the pharmaceutical industry. You need to behave in a certain way, you need to stepwise introduce, you need to be really careful about the regulation of what you can do and what you can't do. But this is something that, that I, we have experienced that, that it, you can really solve it if you work together, but it's not a quick fix. So you have to be, be patient in order to, to achieve the result that you would like to have. Okay. Do the rest of the panel have any experience here? Yep, Thomas, perhaps, perhaps a comment, because I think um, it, it, it is, you know, to Ingela's point, it, it's a challenge for the business model, right? It's not a pill in a box. And I think as, as the data becomes more available and as it's able to demonstrate to um, patients and payers why it's adding value to the healthcare system, I think it find its own path. So there's, you know, there's the sort of the birthing pains, if you like, of a new way of working. But I think over time, they will become more and more standard that if you're bringing a treatment, that you will need to demonstrate which patients it's going to have the right effect in, that it's going to be safe, that you can actually pinpoint which patients uh, shouldn't be taking it because of potential safety effects. There's all sorts of ways this data, you know, and real world evidence that's been collected can impact how a product delivers value. But at the end of the day, the industry and, and healthcare companies will get paid for delivering solutions to patients. Um, and those solutions need to be demonstrated as safe and efficacious. And in the past, that safety and efficacious was all tied up with, you know, a chemical entity of some kind or another, typically in the pharma space. Um, but in the future, it will be combined with data analytics. And I think knowing which patients, how they're going to respond and being able to predict to improve both efficacy and safety will become part of the normal operating procedure. I, th I think as well, just in the commercial space, and, and you know, we haven't talked about med tech so much, but I think this is also an, an area where um, the technology and the digital, you know, AI benefits have huge impact in generating that patient, uh, uh, you know, end-to-end -end care. So delivering value-based care to patients in a hospital setting. And, you know, one of the examples to talk about there, I think, you know, JNJ has a, a partnership with a company in Israel called Zebra Medical, um, where they have x-ray photographs. Um, and those x-ray photographs can be used to try and determine uh, 2D to 3D planning to help in the pre-op stage to make sure that the patient has uh, and the physician has the right kit in the operating uh, theater and that it's best tailored for that patient that they're going to get the best result for their for their um, orthopedic surgery in that process. That's a new way of, of looking at data that adds to the streamlining and effectiveness of patient treatments that wasn't that wasn't there before. Um, so it's not necessarily a defined item that has a price tag attached to it, but it generates better patient outcomes. And I think, you know, there's, there's many, many applications in the med tech space in, in robotics, being able to use digital information and guidance that helps improve surgeons uh, success rates more globally. Uh, where otherwise it might, you know, that, that success rate and that experience might reside very predominantly in a, a smaller set of surgeons who do a high number of procedures. How can you train and teach and how can you take that technology to other surgeons who have then the potential to perform really robust um, uh, operations that have that, that digital and data science sitting behind them that helps guide their surgery process. And so I think that, you know, there's fantastic opportunity. I think at the end of the day, the industry gets paid for delivering good outcomes for patients. And, you know, it's our job to find the right way to demonstrate that and to create that value and, and make those arguments. So, um... I have been consulting a lot of companies, uh, both in, in, in Scandinavia and in the Nordic, but uh, been focused the last five years in Boston and Cambridge, and I've been talking to probably 50, 60 small biotech companies, and um, I've, I've told them that, you know, there are digital tools here in order to complement your drug treatments, uh, but they don't have the resources, they don't have innovation office, they So, we might have lost Thomas. 
AI drive is still the drive. So I, I think we lost Hello. Thomas. Th Thomas, you're breaking up. Oh, sorry. Okay. I'm fine. That's better. Yeah, That's you're back better. again now. Yep, far yeah. away. Far Your company's away. in okay. Cambridge, yeah. Yeah. So, oh, sorry. Yeah, my companies. Uh, there were small biotech companies who certainly could have uh, 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 an opportunity in order to add a, an innovation and digital thing to their drug development, but they don't have the resources. It's too complicated. They just want to do their clinical trials, get FDA or EMA approval, and then on the market. So I'm happy that the big pharma have put a lot of emph emphasis into that. And uh, you all here, four of you, represent the innovation office uh, in big pharma who are putting money in. So I think it will be the big pharma who have the opportunity and the possibility to drive this development. I, I think, you know, probably speaking for all of us, it's it's very unlikely any one stop shop is a solution here. Everything no. is, you know, built on partnerships and expertise. And I think, you know, as this field is very rapidly evolving, we find that expertise in all sorts of different places in, you know, in small industry um, partnerships, in academic partnerships, in other big pharma collaborations. There's so many different places, which is, you know, I guess what makes our lives interesting, you know, looking for it and trying to put together these very um, highly connected yeah. solutions. Okay, shall we um, turn a little to the, the to the Nordic now? And uh, if I, oh, oh, was it Philip who wanted to come in? No, Matt. Matt was going to say something. I think. Matt. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Well, I I, I was suppose that Matt could uh, come in and uh, talk a little more about specifically the Nordic now because you have a good overview of the landscape of these companies in the, in the, in the Nordic region. So please, Mats, could you, could you go ahead? Yeah, sh sure. Uh, no, I, be, I believe, uh, you know, looking at uh, specifically the Nordics, uh, I believe there are, there are a number of places in the world where, where you have sort of a, a perfect storm of science and technology but also a very strong entrepreneurial DNA. And uh, I, I believe we see that in the, in the Nordics and uh, I have a background uh, from, the, from the biotech space. And, uh, you know, uh, there's, there's been there a fantastic uh, development with uh, hundreds of biotech companies from, from the Nordic. And that, that is sort of testament that, that, that there's a strong science and technology base but also capital base, which is which is also sort of also developed. Uh, so I mean, uh, and I, I think we start to see the same in the digital health uh, space, where uh, we sort of uh, see a lot of companies that are, that are following uh, these uh, new trends. And uh, for instance, uh, there are uh, unicorns uh, like Natural Cycles, who have sort of uh, reimagined uh, what the contraception is. By, by launching the first uh, digital contraception and sort of getting it through not only the EU, but also the FDA. But also in the process there, looking at how can we sort of understand more about fertility as well. And that, that these things are sort of very intriguing for, for, uh, for Merck as a, as a company to look at these uh, things. And uh, we even uh, work also with a company in the US uh, that uh, sort of launched the first uh, Achille the first uh, uh, game that, that is approved by the FDA to treat ADHD. So there are a lot of really cool and mind-blowing mind, uh, uh, technologies uh, sort of uh, emerging. Uh, but we also have, uh, when we look at what, what Merck uh, does, and one of the, of the collaborations that we have launched from my innovation lab is collaboration with a fertility company called Bonzoon, where we have sort of uh, looked at sort of what are the problems in this space and where we can offer them a, a solution as a software as a service for IVF clinics. And the objective is basically to sort of empower the patient with the information around this journey. But, uh, and, and you can then argue that that's nothing new, but with these sort of uh, uh, data and new tools, you can actually individualize the treatment pathway and journey in a 
completely new way. So you not only you get really personalized treatment experience, and this opens up uh, also sort of new avenues. These are sort of examples from uh, from from uh, from Sweden, but in Finland we also see lots coming out from from uh, from the Nokia and the universities uh, in, in Finland. Uh, I like a company called Popit that sort of have a new take on, on adherence. I work with Novartis, uh, but also from uh, from Denmark uh, companies like drug stores that are sort of also reimagining how the, the treatment experience and the adherence journey looks like that is very different from, from what a pharma company would sort of uh, come up with if we put some clever people in a, in a, in a, in a room. And then, but I believe also that the whole sort of healthcare structure is, is sort of also evolving quickly. And uh, here at the Nordics has a leadership role. Uh, and uh, we just look at what's, going, what's happening now with the uh, online doctors. If you look at the five most downloaded uh, online doctor apps in Europe, three out of those are, are actually from Sweden. So, and these are sort of, uh, I call them sometimes digital Vikings. You know, uh, <laughs> you have a great technology, a uh, sense of urgency and entrepreneurship, and go off to distant shores uh, to do business. And uh, and uh, and uh, this, this uh, links then into what, what we discussed earlier. That I believe uh, the hard part is, is we have the technology today. There also has to be receiving a customer that sort of is willing to pay for it, and that is also starting to shift. And uh, one interesting example is Germany, where they have sort of made a jump start over the last year to sort of start open up a third reimbursement pathway for digital health applications. And this is a sea change in one of the world's largest economies. So, and, uh, and there are now a lot of companies from the Nordics are looking at this opportunity to, uh, to, uh, to launch there. But at the same time, this also shows what is lacking in the Nordics. And I believe a predictive commercial model for these type of innovative solutions that we discussed, be it like uh, diagnosing, uh, depression in MS with your voice, uh, or we invested in, in a company like that, or ADHD, or, or new ways to work with contraception. There's no clear commercial model for these type of companies in the, in the Nordic. So they, they go uh, and find um, new, better opportunities in Germany, in the US, and so on. So to capture the full potential, uh, I believe uh, the society and the whole healthcare has to move into this uh, into a new setting and reimagine how we how we work with the, the data. So that that is sort of where we, our market science and technology company tries to put these things together to see how they fit in, but at the same time look at near term commercial opportunities as well, as well because that's where you have to start. Someone has to pay for the solutions, otherwise it's just dreams. Yeah. So I think we are ending, uh, uh, getting close to the end of the, uh, our panel, uh, but I want uh, all of you to get your opportunity in order to say if some few words. Uh, where do you see the greatest uh, breakthrough and innovation in your space? Uh, could, you, could, could, uh, could we start with Inga Lil and then uh, I could show. Be short because we have only four minutes left. Okay. Yeah, I will continue the commercial models because I think that that's where we need to uh, to find another way. I mean, what should be added uh, on top of your products when you're applying for a price and reimbursement? What do you need to provide the authorities in order to, to get your product approved to the price you at least want to? Uh, I think this is also something that we need to show to other authorities, I mean, to all payers, uh, to, to the entire healthcare society, uh, we will in the future to come be forced to evaluate the efficacy, safety and efficacy uh, of all our launch products uh, um, as we maybe didn't do uh, to that extent uh, in the past. Uh, so I think that's the most important message for me. So, so uh, Phil, what's yeah, your take, uh, final uh, comment? A couple of comments. Um, it, it, it's it's going to be first and foremost to continue to be having a having a molecule, having a drug that is efficacious to to a patient, 
but the solution, as we heard before, is that it is important and bringing benefit to the patient by bringing together a range of digital or med tech approaches to complement that uh, therapeutic or, or vaccine will become important um, to, to provide greater benefit to the patient and to the right patient populations. Okay. Um, Matt? No, I believe this uh, sort of a combination of a scientific and uh, responsible entrepreneurship will sort of uh, uh, bring us uh, to sort of uh, yeah, new solutions that will be in benefit millions of people. And uh, the sort of holy grail would then be in preventive health, uh, uh, gathering, gathering data, working with that, and combining different sort of interventions. So my answer would be preventive health. And, uh, and basically also solving some of these sort of really tough chronic air diseases uh, that, that we sort of see something new shape up where you basically uh, don't have to sort of go to an hospital very regularly. You can, you can uh, be treated very, very easily in your, in your home setting and basically not notice that you have a disease. So those uh, sort of things, what? preventive health and new take on chronic diseases. Yeah, I, I couldn't. I couldn't agree more, Matt. I think you know prevention. This this whole um, uh, ecosystem allows us to monitor, predict, keep people well, right? And how do we value that as a society? And how do we uh, build business models around keeping people well? And uh, the cost of prevention can be so much lower than the cost of treating some of these very expensive, complex diseases. And I think the other the other application for me that's really exciting is taking those patients who are already sick and preventing relapse. So mental health relapses, all these kind of uh, situations which are really complex being managed by not just the patient, but their family and their medical teams can be absolutely enabled by these kind of technologies. And again, it takes cost out of the healthcare systems, keeps people well, keeps people happy. And I think the, the opportunity is huge. And you know, we've all got lots of work to do. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. There, there is a lot of innovation going on in this. And I think the classical model to develop drugs and only give drugs to patients uh, is end with this because there will be a lot of other technology that will complement uh, the drug treatments and uh, also the healthcare delivery for sure. So there will be an exciting time in the years to come. Uh, certainly the big pharma will drive this, hopefully. Um, uh, it seems that the COVID-19 have uh, driven that also and uh, in order to get a couple of more years step in order for everybody healthcare regulators and so accept this kind of tools so with that i thank the panel uh, thank lsx for organizing the panel and um, have a nice evening all of you thank you very much goodbye thanks very much thank you, thank you. bye bye, bye, -bye.